seconds. That what? No. Can you ask questions and have the answers on the screen? <laughs> <laughs> Can you just know what his questions are going to be and answer them before he asks them? I think we'll is what he wants. Questions on the screen. No answers. No, this is machine learning, not machine psychics. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm not going to sit back down. Okay. I don't know about this Windows computer. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> All right. So I'm Matt. This is Jason. We work at Clearwater Analytics across the street, and we just wanted to talk a little bit about Upstairs. reinforcement learning. Oh yeah, upstairs. Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> We're actually in this building. It's been a long day. Uh, we think reinforcement learning is really cool. It's pretty new. I mean, ish. The last four years or so have uh, really seen a lot of movement with DeepMind releasing some uh, integrations of deep neural nets into reinforcement learning. Uh, so it's an exciting space, but it moves really, really fast, like most ML. But like every day, it's changing. So. This will be kind of uh, foundational concepts and then some cool examples of things that are going on right now. But I mean, there's just so, so much more that we won't be able to cover today. And we have 15 minutes officially, right? Technically, we have room till 8, okay. but I think you We're might get edge through, thrown time. in. So we'll do our best. Okay, so quick agenda, basic concepts, like I said. Uh, I'm going to cover these two sort of fundamental points behind reinforcement learning. You have this trade-off of, uh, well, I'll get to this, but there's this fundamental dilemma of whether you should exploit things that you know to be good now, or should you explore for things that might be better later. Uh, and then a policy and a value function, these are ways that you train a reinforcement learning agent or algorithm to interact with its environment, to get rewards, or to, to do this exploration and exploitation. And then Jason will show examples, current applications of this technology, and then show some tools that you can use to experiment with it yourself, and then resources if you want a little more. Uh, there's some really great classes out there that are free. All right, so reinforcement learning lives in kind of a different space than regular, like supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Whereas with a supervised algorithm, you might have some data set where you have truth, you know, and you're trying to uh, approximate a function that can predict the correct value given a particular input. Reinforcement learning is really about solving a problem that's maybe a, a multi-step optimization or uh, learning how to interact with an environment, like I said, to maximize a reward, like to get the highest score in a video game or to, I don't know, that would be the example for now. We'll get to some others. So just know that it's kind of in this other space, although it does use deep learning concepts, you know, inside. And there's sort of, it kind of bleeds together, but the problem that it's solving is really the key difference. So uh, this cartoon, you've probably seen if you've read anything about reinforcement learning. This one's better because it has Mario on it. <laughs> is that uh, a Donkey Kong? Yeah, well, sure. Uh, on the right, you have the environment. And this is the thing that you're interacting with. So if you're going to work with reinforcement learning, you're, you're, you're going to write an agent, which is the algorithm that does the, the operation. Uh, you may have to write the environment as well, depending on what problem you're solving. But the environment uh, can be acted upon, and so there's some usually discrete set of actions that the agent can take to change the environment. And then the <coughs> signal that comes out of the environment for the agent to learn is what the next state looks like, so how was the environment affected by that action, and then some kind of reward signal, like did you do a good job progressing towards your goal, or, or did you do a bad job? So, and that reward signal, you usually have to write that, and that's absolutely critical because it guides the progress of your agent as it learns. So, just kind of keep this picture in mind as we think about, we'll mostly talk about what goes on in here uh, throughout this conversation, but if you're, if you're doing something that's not a canned, or you know, like if you're doing image classification with supervised learning, you can just kind of pick up that algorithm and fine tune it. There's not a lot of environments out there to do the kinds of things you're going to do in a business application. So you would probably end up needing to write an environment. All right, so a simple optimization problem. We have a maze. It's not a maze. We have a grid with a mouse trying to get some cheese. And every step it takes, it gets a minus one reward. That's its feedback from the environment. It doesn't know where anything is. It just knows that it's trying to get the cheese. And if it gets it, it'll get a big reward. So these arrows indicate some wind that will push the agent. 
after it makes a move. So it can choose to move up, down, left, or right, and then it will get some, it'll get a negative one reward <coughs> for every step it takes, and it's trying to optimize the shortest path to the cheese, right? The smallest negative reward. So what, what this will do if you train it to a, to a perfect policy is it will learn that it can walk over this far, it will get pushed up by the wind, and it can continue taking steps up. There's a fence, right, so it doesn't get blown off. And it will come around the uh, non-windy side and then come back up to the cheese. And this might be a little non-intuitive or unintuitive because you might think you could come down the bottom and be pushed up into the cheese, but based on the way they formulated this, it's designed not to be able to do that. So you'll actually overshoot it. So this is just a, a, an example of how a negative reward for each time step helps the agent learn to quickly find the cheese, and then it, you know, just by its nature of exploring the environment, has to learn how to navigate that wind. So, yeah. So, so is the idea that like you would run it, so like you start off, like, let's say you're doing the old mouth and cheese example, like this is the first time you've ever done it, but that's the big answer you want to find. So is the idea that in like this scenario, you're going to let it just run a certain number of times, and then eventually it's going to figure out what the best method is, and then that's what it reports back? Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have noted, in most of these examples, you're going to have a, a bounded uh, episode. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you'll let it take maybe 20 steps. And if it hasn't found the cheese, you can terminate and start over. And, and it depends on the problem. If you want to have rewards happen uh, and update the sort of <clears throat> internal understanding, the model, uh, at every step, or at the end of an episode, or only if you find the cheese, these are all things you can decide if you're right in the environment. Okay, so you could like, so your environment could be like, again, I wanna predict housing prices. So like if you like say, like you could set like a rule that's like, oh, if you make calculations and they're like so far off of what's currently here, just end it and start over because clearly you did no, something wrong. Yeah. Is that kind of the idea? That'd be like classification or like a regression, uh, in that case would be a regression problem. Yeah. So this is an environment that you can interact with. So like a, in robotics, the robot tries to move through the world and the environment's going to change because its uh, vantage point changes. Um, so that those are the types of environments that we're talking about. So in this case, the windy world, the mouse may not know that it's a windy world. It just knows that it moves forward three times and after it moves forward three times, the next time the state is uh, brought back to it, it's, it realizes that it's been moved. Um, so it's in environments that change um, instead of something like that, which would be aggression. Is that, is that how? Yep. We, we're going to have a lot more examples. <laughs> I just want to add something. I, I completely agree with Jason, but the motivation, in my opinion, to use reinforced learning over uh, say machine learning is because your geometry has exploded and become impractical. And it, then it's great for those kind of problems. The problem you're describing can still be dealt with with deep learning or machine learning. Okay. It might become clearer. I've got like two other concepts that might help concretize it a little. So this, this idea that the mouse is in the environment doesn't know anything about it. <clears throat> it has to do a certain amount of random exploration because it doesn't, it doesn't know what's out there. So there's this fundamental problem of exploitation versus exploration and it's usually uh, addressed this way where you have this multi-armed bandit. Why are you smiling? I just miss you, man. Okay, so <laughs> you can imagine you're sitting in front of a row of slot machines and you come at this with no prior knowledge. You didn't get to see anyone else playing or whatever. And you don't know what the payout probabilities are for these machines, but they all have their own independent probability. And you want to maximize your money, right? You want to get the most total reward over time. So initially, you don't know what's going on. You just have to pull one at random. Let's say we pulled the first one and we get a payout. And so our ridiculously simple internal model says, 100% of the time, this machine pays out. So it might be a good next step to choose the same arm, right? To choose the same machine uh, because it, it has paid out pretty well. But you know, the second time it doesn't, so 50%. So like, you have this dilemma of at what point should I go over to another machine and try and get a better reward or, or just a reward? Like, do you wait till this is at 1% or you know? This is the the, the basic problem. You have to figure out which series of lever pulls will give you the best reward over time without knowing anything about them other than just to experience the, uh, the reward signal. So this is another way of looking at it. Uh, more mice and cheese. Uh, so you have this mouse on a grid and he's trying to get the most cheese. 
And nearby, he's got little cheese, like maybe one, and they regenerate when he eats them. So he could just sit here forever and eat little cheese. But there's like a million cheese in the corner, and there's also some death, like rat traps or something, rat poison. So if we bound this again, like say to 20 time steps, he could sit here and randomly explore once and then say, cool, I got cheese, and then eat it 20 times, and he has 20 reward. Or he could pick random actions all the time, and maybe he'd get the big cheese, but it might take heat death of the universe. Or he could incorporate some slightly more intelligent policy, where the simplest is to say, I will do the best thing that I know now, but then sometimes, with some small probability, I'll do something random. So, eat the cheese that's really good and close for a while, but then every now and then, like maybe 10% of the time, I'll just take a random move, and eventually get up to that and maximize the reward. So that's the exploration versus exploitation. And this is all kind of coming down to the, the policy. The policy is the basic thing that defines how an agent behaves. And again, the agent is the algorithm you're writing to interact with the environment and, and get the most rewards. So that's the policy says this is how you should behave given the current state. Like if the mouse is right here, a good policy would be a move up, right? If it had its only choice is to move up, left, down, or right. And a good policy would say if you're near the poison, don't eat it. So uh, again, mouse and cheese, because these work really well, uh, a policy in this maze would look like this. It would say you should always move right if you're at the beginning cell. Or if you're stuck in this uh, cave back here, you should always move up to get out. It's deterministic. It just says if you're here, do this. This is not terribly realistic, don't usually have such a simple action space or simple environment, and so in general you're going to have a, like a probability distribution over the possible actions. So is your policy analogous to your model? Is the policy what is actually getting learned? Is what's actually getting updated? Uh, let me go through the next two slides. And then it won't make any more sense, that, but I can stall. <laughs> that was a different question. Okay, so hold on. So there's two ways to formulate goodness of the current state. <clears throat> the state value function says, given where I am right now, if I follow the policy that I have developed, what's the biggest return I can expect to get to the end of the episode? Or if the episode doesn't terminate, then just out some series of time steps. So it's just saying, given where I am, how good can it be? So for this mouse maze, this is the same idea where for every time step you get a negative one reward until you get to the goal. So if you're at the spot right before the goal, a perfect state value function would say, I know that my expected total reward from there to the end is minus one, because every step I take is minus one. Or like if you're at the, <clears throat> the very beginning, it's seven steps to the goal, if you count the last step to the cheese as a step. So I know that from here to the end of the episode, assuming I do the correct movements, I can expect negative seven reward. The other way to look at it, and I think this is probably more common, is you just add action into that. So you say, given the state that I'm in, if I go left or if I go right, and then follow my policy from there on out, how well can I expect to do? So this is more like a one-step prediction where you say, I'm going to do this thing that isn't necessarily the best action. And then I'm going to follow my best action policy from then on out. How well can I do? So that kind of might look like this. This is really looking at what the optimal action is. But this says, uh, in this state, if I go right, I can expect a minus 7 total return. And in the next state over, if I go right, those cells would also internally have some uh, well, like these would, have some representation of if I go down, I could expect the total return of minus 8. And if I go up, it's better. So this is just showing the optimal movement, but okay. Now, so back to your question. Is the policy, policy what you're policy look like every single grid, uh, every single cell here has a value associated with it? And In the that's simplest form, what you're trying well, to Well, that's the, the value function determines it, but the policy itself is completely independent of its value. The policy is simply the, the policy is the thing that you will always do. And, and that's it for, so let's say my policy is to always walk forward. 
and someone else's policy is to always go left. Oh, and so there's an infinite number of policies, if, if I was in this grid. And so there is, and so there, there is a policy for this discrete state space in which you're going to go directly with cheese. And so the policy, though, basically is the, uh, the function that determines what you do. So given an input, this is what I'm going to do next. And the Seems value functions are how you actually determine the goodness of the policy. So yeah, the policy, the policy is something be. other than choose the lowest weight <coughs> always, yes. and your reward function is what really Well, you don't know what that is reward is for really the policy. Is, what, is that what you're trying to the learn? Yeah you're trying to, yeah, you're trying to learn the best policy. There is an optimal policy, and then there are generally, well, there are not optimal policies. But the policy is, it's your, it is the logic. Do you logic. learn a reward function too as you go, or you yeah. have to you put that in ahead of time? The reward informs these. So you, the, the policy doesn't have to follow the like optimal action value, right? The policy can say, I want to do a random exploration, mm -hmm. or some other concepts Jason will touch on, like curiosity. Like, I want to reward not following the best action, because I don't want to fall into a local minima or something. So, yeah, the policy defines how you act with respect to these. Does that make sense? I know. So, so give, me two, you, give me two slides. I'll yeah, one more. Watch this. <laughs> Watch I think this. this is well, this yeah. actually took me a while to figure this Understanding out. Understanding a cheat. So, in the, <laughs> in the simplest form, you'll, you'll enumerate every state and every action and build a grid of how good it is to take that action given that state. So if I'm in state five, like whatever cell on the grid, if I move up, it's negative one. Or if I get the cheese, it's a And that's your reward. That matrix is your reward. No. Oh, okay. No, the, remember the reward is the signal that comes from the environment. <clears throat> and so in the mouse environments, it's always minus one until you get the cheese yeah. for each step. Yeah. Uh, so all these are minus ones. This is not the same dimensionality, but like those would be the getting the cheeses or whatever. But those elements map are the rewards, right? Not necessarily, because okay. you discount rewards too, depending on how far away the action was from getting it. So True, but I just mean those negative ones are trying to speed the mouse up to get there, right? So they're rewards, they're just negative rewards. The hundreds are Well, the all I'm saying is your state value function or your action value function does not have to directly uh, represent the rewards. Okay. There's some function that you use to update this table based on the reward and based on some other things. But this is your action value. This is not a this this is, this is not your policy. No, this is this an is action value function. function. And so what I'm saying is, you can learn this if you have a tiny trivial problem, and then you could say, oh, if I'm in state five, I should always take action five because it's really good. Um, so if you can learn this, it doesn't really make sense to, or your policy could be as simple as. I mean, it could be a simple walk. It could be, yes. but remember, this might all start with zeros like or random numbers. And so uh, you'll still need some concept of exploration. Okay. So to use the mouse and cheese example, so using that chart there on the left, so example like the state in this case would be what cell you're on, yeah. and the action would be do I go right, left, yeah. up, or down. So in this case, you know, so again, if it's negative one for every step, it's like, so it's saying, okay, state zero at the very first. So like, in that case, like, it doesn't matter where I go, I'm gonna get negative one, so okay. But if I pick going right, for example, <laughs> number right, let's say, is state number one, and then it examines from there, and then so from there it just goes through every single possibility, kind of brute force kind of style? Uh, yeah, this table gets filled out brute force. Okay. So uh, if you're in the first state, the correct, you know, value is minus eight, right? If you have a perfect policy, you know that by the time I get to the end, the best I can do is minus eight, or minus seven, or whatever it was. I think it was minus seven. So you might initially put minus one here, because you've only taken one step in the environment. And then on another episode, you might come through and do the same thing, and this would get adjusted. But the, the point of this is to say, this is totally intractable for a real problem, where you have like a self-driving car. You have a continuous space, state space, or it doesn't even have to be continuous to be too big to fit in a table. And so we get into function approximation. It doesn't have to be a neural net, but you know, we've implemented just like a linear function approximator to get the concept figured out. But the idea is you have some state representation, whether it's just the cell ID or something better, you know, big feature vector for a neural net. 
that says this is the current state, pass it through one or more neural nets, and then hopefully get some prediction out the end that says which action would be best to take. So if I'm actually in state zero, action zero, mm -hmm. uh, would I be able to actually kind of determine my expected re reward? Because I know I can either go forward or mm -hmm. go down, and therefore the expected value discounted backwards mm -hmm. will actually give me my reward. Is that the case? It would, yeah, it would give you the expected total return given taking that action from state zero to the end of the episode following your policy. So th this, these numbers are probably not very good to put on here. I think they're confusing. But the idea is that if I'm in state zero and I take this action and then follow my policy until the end, how good will it be? How so what, what do you call the are? end? You mean so the end of the episode? Yep. Either I got the cheese or I terminated it because it was too many steps long. I usually put a limit on it, at least for these kind of toy environments. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of. We need to give Jason some time to talk, too. This is the last That's slide. That's why I'm asking questions. Just I don't want to hear that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think you're up. We Any need more, more questions, questions later. Before I were those tough? <laughs> <laughs> Yours was so good. Okay. Right. Yes. I was trying to make you look good. Thank you, Drew. All right, so Matt talked about uh, some of the uh, things that you use to build, uh, like a reinforcement learning model. I'm going to be talking about the ways to exercise that reinforcement learning model and hopefully go over some things that will solidify, like the different ways that we can use this. So I'm going to talk about uh, AI Gym first. <clears throat> this is the first. Uh, thing you'll usually run into when you're looking at reinforcement learning. This is uh, the inverted pendulum. So you have the environment um, that's going to give you the observation space. Um, observation space in this case is three numbers, right? You're going to have the position, velocity, pull angle, and the velocity at the tip. So it's working on just these four pieces of information. In your action space, you have two things that you can do. You can bump it to the left or you can bump it to the right. So it's going to present, uh, the environment's going to present the observation space to your agent and it has to do something, right? So it's going to do something and then you give the action to the environment the environment's going to return what happened, the, the current environment, and you just continue to do that. Um, this is, is, again, it's like the, the entry level for reinforcement learning is one of their, their beginning ones. Um, so I'm going to, this is just where we start. Before I move on, is, is that clear? We're good? All right. So Centipede, uh, they have a lot of the Atari games, I think this is, I'm not positive on that, um, that you can use uh, reinforcement learning models on. In this case, the observation space is uh, when you render this environment, it gives you the image. So you actually have to use the image um, to be able to pull information out of this environment. Um, so in this case, you're going to use like a convolutional network. Um, when they prevent, uh, present the uh, like the, when they render the environment, um, you're going to stack a couple of them so that you can convolve over all of them at the same time because you need to have an idea of movement, right? If you just have a solid uh, one image, you don't know if uh, what way the little blue guy is going or how fast he's going or anything like that. So you're going to have to have multiple images to be able to stack to be able to figure out what's happening in each, uh, each stage of the environment. All right, on the right, we have the action space. Um, I find that this was interesting when I, I've uh, made a couple of the gym environments myself trying to tackle things at work, and I hadn't addressed it like this. I think it's just interesting. So what I would have done, which I have learned is probably not the best way to do this, is I would have created five, right, uh, or six. No operation, fire, up, down, left, right. What they've done is they've made it so you can't uh, make an illegal move. You can't go up and down at the same time, right? Um, so they've, they've prevented the model from being able to do that, uh, which I, it makes sense, right? With the computer, you can have many, many different things. I was thinking of like uh, with the ASWD on the keyboard, right? That makes sense to me as a person, but as a computer, you can enumerate this massive list of things that it can do. So I understand why they do that. So this is how, uh, you know, the, the environment for Centipede. Well, they're doing this because I think this is because the, for discrete action space, you can only choose to do one thing. Yes. And so normally you could, if you're playing the video game, you can 
push the button and push the joystick out simultaneously. And so you have to have some action that captures all those things. So I guess what I was, I, uh, I wasn't clear on that. What I would, what I had originally done was I made like a multi-label mm -hmm. environment where you, I, I was expecting that it would be able to say, I'm going to do multiple things at the same time. I'm going to fire and I'm going to go up and I'm going to go left. So it would uh, put like a, you know, what the Boolean, it would uh, flip those into ones so that it was doing multiple things at the same time. And that's what I was thinking it would do. Um, but yeah, so this is, they just listed them out. So you're right with the discrete space. All right, this is a newer one. This is from Text World. Um, there's a game, Zork, um, uh, from a ways back. You can do like a text adventures. Um, I remember some of this when I was a kid. Uh, so this is from Microsoft, as you can see here. Uh, it, it tells you how to solve it, how to solve the puzzle. It's right here in the first paragraph. It says, please do this and you will win. Um, one of the reasons Microsoft has released this is to be able to incorporate uh, uh, curriculum learning. Uh, and this is newer to reinforcement learning and you don't really need as much in regular machine learning. The idea with curriculum learning is, is that you're going to help the, uh, help the agent learn easier things and then it's gonna progress, which makes sense. This is uh, us like imposing how you know, being human makes sense to us to, to machines and it seems to work out. Um, so this is, when you render it, environment render, I did this on my computer, it re renders the environment. You actually have to be able to con uh, consume this with the model, right? So in this case, you're gonna use a RNN or an LSTM to be able to understand the, uh, how the language works and what words uh, you know, are gonna follow each other and it's gonna have to understand some of those things. Um, the environment, excuse me, the observation space is natural language. The action space is based on the vocabulary. The vocabulary is static based on uh, like 20 keywords. You can move, you can pick up, you can drop, you can move this from here to there. Um, you can put this into an object. The things that change is like latch key, um, spherical locker. These are gonna change for every environment. Um, so you may run like 100 environments and you're only gonna have a couple that have latch keys. So it's gonna have to start to understand the natural language and what pieces of information in the sentence it needs to remember. Um, and like I said, with the curriculum learning, you can start off where it's not gonna show you the answer right at the beginning too. This is just like the initial example. So in this case, the observation space is uh, natural language and the action space is uh, like a vocabulary, uh, which, they, which they provide. It's uh, like 278 different uh, switches you can play. All right, now I think this is where it gets really interesting because this is uh, uh, where we, this is stuff that I find interesting. Well, I'm really excited about reinforcement learning. Uh, is anybody familiar with Unity? It's a video game platform. I've never played with it. Um, I've watched a bunch of videos on it at this point because it's pretty neat. Uh, it's, uh, the idea is that you can, uh, it's like push button, it abstracts away all the boring stuff about making video games. You can say, I want a ball, and it floats in the air, and they say, I want gravity. You push the gravity button, and now gravity is in your environment. Um, so it, it, what it has turned out to be is a great environment for reinforcement learning because games have to be incredibly fast, right? You need to be able to do things super fast in the video game to have people uh, like uh, work with them. So they've, uh, they've got a big AI team and they're uh, using this as a, as a tool. And the next three videos are actually uh, from Unity. <clears throat> All right, so let me show this video. I'll, I'll, I'll start it. Um, Explain uh, something real quick and then continue. Sure. Does anybody here know what the internet is? <laughs> I use my phone. Yeah. I do. There's the Broncos gas, and you have to like click through. It like pops up, and you give them their e your email address, and then it lets you on. At least on my phone. Um, <coughs> Usually a student jumps up and says, the password is. <laughs> we seem I, to be fresh out of students. <laughs> I, I have one that's linked to my email if I'd like to send it to Edgar Home, but. Um, yeah, Bronco yes. yeah, if you do that, but then it, Jason was trying to do that and it doesn't show up on his. But I'm sorry, keep going. Do you want me to try to sign in my account on Edgar Home? Um, Jason, would you like him Here, to use this? That slides up to some it's easier. Oh, perfect. So you're on the Yeah, I signed it. It's because it's a MacBook. 
And it is, it just worked. It just yeah. Worked. <laughs> You're like, I don't even have to touch it. <laughs> All right, okay, so I see what we're doing. Okay, so. We can't see anything, though. Yeah, yeah. You might need to hit the little screen. See, it didn't just work. They're going to act it out. Uh. There you go. Oh, <coughs> is this the same thing? Yeah. All right. Yes, it's the same. Jason, how come you didn't get a Mac? Because I wanted a touch screen. Okay. And I figured I had a drawing on today was fun. Yeah. All right. All right. So we can see in the background, we have four agents. These were all trained independently, uh, but you see the uh, uh, emergent behavior, not because you uh, named the agent, uh, goalie or striker. Um, there's emergent behavior because you gave it different rewards. <coughs> when the team makes a reward, the two blue guys, or two blue uh, gals, whatever, they get different rewards based on um, what the reward is. If you're a striker and your team goal gets a goal, you get a, you get a point if the other team gets uh, yeah, I mean, you can read it here. Basically, the striker and goalie have different objectives. So that is why you see them naturally gravitating to certain areas. Um, I'll start it and I'll continue to talk. Okay, actually, sorry. The observation space in this, it's a local rate cast. Uh, my understanding of this, and anybody uh, stand up and correct me uh, if I'm wrong, or just be quiet, you know. Um, it's like a laser, like a late. LIDAR, LIDAR or something like that. So you have like a bunch of lasers that are going on in front of you to give, give you an understanding of what uh, is in front of you. So if I was this blue soccer player right here, this is my eyeball. That is its, uh, that's what it sees. It sees that there's a boxy shape in front of it, uh, possibly, probably that it's red. I think they can de detect color. Uh, so that's, that's the observation space. So if it moves a little bit, it has changed its perception of the environment. All right. Um, the actions, it can move up, down, or uh, it can move around in its environment, and it can jump as well. And they, they do that when they kick. Jason, real quick. Yeah. Do you happen to know the training methodology they used for these agents? I don't understand tra training methodology. Well, so there's Markov, there's uh, Monte oh. Carlo. Uh, I suspect they did. I, I mean, it's not like a simple method. It's not like a Monte my, my Carlo. Um, so they probably like a actor critic method or something probably close to state of the art. What did you um, call it again? Actor critic. Actor critic. Um, Google has like an AC2 and an AC3. They have, there's there's some definitely really awesome uh, okay. things that they're doing with. Uh, Reinforcement learning, which are pretty difficult to put together from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll mention a library that does a pretty good job with them. So it's kind of a grid you can almost draw up of is your input and your output space continuous or, or, or is it discrete? And um, so in this case, it's continuous, continuous, and, and, that, and, and it's almost always active critic. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So here we go. But Jason, this is a perfect example of something you could not do with machine learning or deep learning yeah I mean you could possibly get like a, a chain of models to approximate this but it would be